I guess the reward is that with every step, you are freer. If one day you go without calorie counting and you go, oh, oh my God, I haven't done that in, I haven't done that in 10 years. That's one day that you were freer. And it might not seem like much, even if you eat a banana and didn't think about how many calories it had, that is a win. And every single win gets you closer to freedom of your, you know, your trauma, not running your behaviors. And I just, I think that that work is worth it, even if it's never going to be perfect. Hi guys, and welcome back to the Thick Thighs Save Lives podcast. I'm Kelsey. Hi guys, I'm Rachel. And how so bougie are we this morning? We didn't plan. Cheers. Cheers. We didn't even plan our bouginess. And I was like, look at my fancy coffee and my fancy cup. And you were like, wait a minute. Mine's Hold green. on. <laughs> Hold the phone if we're talking fancy. Here's the thing. You know, if you want to like, this is what I always say when I get matcha. I was like, this is my um, superiority for the day. Because there's nothing like leaving the coffee shop with a green coffee to get people to be like, oh, what's that? You so, you so healthy you your coffee's green. It's kind of like the equivalent of having a gym membership at Equinox. (laughs) Except now you leave there feeling like superior piece of shit. (laughs) Well, that's my green matcha. I'm like, I I think I'm so cool because I have a green caffeine source, but really I'm just a piece of shit trying to get through the day. No, listen, fake it till you make it is a real thing. And I have decided that um, I will continue doing it for the rest of forever. But I did hear, so I recently heard this sound that was like, I've I've decided that I don't have imposter syndrome anymore because if throughout this entire time I have fooled ev- everyone into thinking I'm awesome and upbeat and beautiful, like blah, 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 named like all these things successful, then like maybe – Maybe that's just true. And I don't need to have imposter syndrome anymore. And I was, I, I played it multiple times that I do that. If I hear something, I know I you really stim, like, you stim on sounds. I, I know. Yeah, I, I stim on sounds hard guys. Like it's, it's a thing and it'll just repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, and those are some of the things that I do where like, if I hear something that really like resonates with me, I'm like, I'm going to listen to this more times. I'm sure there's some science behind that that says that's helpful to really like let it sink in. Um, I don't have it today because we have some different science going on, but um, it's one of the things I do. And I implore you all to do something similar where like, This has nothing to do with our topic, but imposter syndrome is constantly following so many of us around and it's just like, just call it out for being like, I will not have you anymore. You are fake. I am not an imposter. (laughs) You are fake. I'm not fake. (laughs) You're the fake one. (laughs) you will not call me an imposter i know i if i've made it this far maybe it's actually real well the matcha is just because i can't sleep so i'm trying to do a different version of caffeine so yeah no i don't know i don't know i just you know i do these things with the with my i don't know this is a new thing and by new i mean in the past like five years so it's not like super new but um I never, yeah, I never struggled in that area before, but now I'm like constantly struggling and it's always anxiety induced. So it's just like, uh, you know, but I, I did get this new alarm clock. I don't know why I think this is, I always try to buy my way out of anxiety. I'm like, okay, I know what to do. I'll get a sound bath. Um, that, that, uh, that's what I'll do. I'll just, I'll get a sound bath sound and then I'll I'll just I won't be as anxious I don't want to like do any of the you know actual techniques and habits I'll just, yeah yeah mm-hmm. I just I get a new alarm clock and I'm like yeah this is gonna be it you are not alone but the alarm clock's great I want to tell you about this alarm clock okay oh so you do like it 
Well, I do because um, one of the things that I've been trying to do is add more meditation, especially before I go to sleep. Um, I it's know that idea. there's a lot of studies on that and, you know, I'm, I'm trying all my things. So and it's one of our movement calendar habits. So if you have not jumped in on the movement calendar yet, please just do it. And even if you don't feel like you can do every day, just jump in on some of those habits you like and meditation is one of them. Yeah. Download the calendar and you'll get like set days where you're going to, you know, have that as a focus. And that really helps too to be like, okay, it's, you know, Sunday and this is my meditation day. And it just, that's like how you um, work on your habits. So, but, um, I was finding that like, I was having a lot of, I don't know, friction with my meditation of like not knowing what to do, not knowing what I'm supposed to be thinking about and not having like it close, not letting whatever. your thoughts run wild. <laughs> it, so I, I got this alarm clock and it like doubles as a, um, you know, it's got a lot of features. I like a lot of features <laughs> and it has this, you know, setting where like at a certain time, it like kind of says like, it's time for bed. And then it starts your meditation, like sort of for you. So it's like, okay, at nine 20, and then it's going to like start some soothing sounds. And then like, it goes into like, are you ready for your meditation? And like, then, and you have this like guided thing. I didn't have to look for it. I didn't have to like Google, like guided meditation. I, it just like comes on and it's, um, it's really helpful so far. I still am not sleeping, but I, but I have hope. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all going to come together. So what's your alarm clock? That, well, that is, that's it. It's like, yeah, it's in the alarm. Clock. Oh, it's your alarm clock to go to sleep. Also, it's an alarm clock that wakes you up. Like it's like a full ass oh. thing. It's called the lofty. It's, it's got your whole sleep habit routine in there from start to finish. So. Mm-hmm. Trying to buy my way out of anxiety again. Let's see if it works. Um, so today's topic, I really, uh, you know, I was, when I was thinking about this, what actually led me to this was um, I was listening to another podcast, which I really love, which is We Can Do Hard Things. It's um, one of my favorite authors, Glennon. Ann Glennon. And she was, she had an episode where she was discussing um, trigger warning. Um, she was discussing her eating disorder. Did you hear this episode? No, any chance I, so, I haven't been doing a good job listening to her podcast, but I also really like it. It's a great podcast. And, um, you know, she has struggled for a long time with an eating disorder and she was sort of talking about, um, some of the things that she's uncovered as of late when she's had a relapse with, um, the behaviors and things that go along with this, this kind of disordered thinking And it really got me to thinking about behaviors and the way that we assess them, the way we reevaluate them, specifically at this time of year, because this is like a big one for it's a new year. And these are the things that I'm not happy with. And these are the behaviors that I feel are holding me back from, you know, living my living my truth. And these are the things that I want to change, right? We have a lot of in the spirit of resolutions or even just self-reflection, looking back at like, okay, you know, what kind of year did I have and what kind of year do I want to have and how much control do I have over that with my behavior? Um, So I think it's productive definitely to self-reflect in that way. But I think that one of the problems with it is that we don't as human beings truly understand behaviors. And so because we don't understand them, the the route that we take to try to address them or change them or adjust them is a little bit roundabout and often ineffective because we do not actually get to the root cause of the behavior ever. We kind of skirt around it and try to make changes. And then all of a sudden we end up with the same resolutions every single year because we haven't truly changed the behavior because we never really addressed it. Yeah, I think that's a great point because there's so much that goes into behaviors. And I think as humans, we either identify that in a way 
that we are the behavior and not separating ourselves from the behaviors that we have developed over years. And I think there's kind of a two-step to that where like you can show, you can identify a behavior just like you identify anything else that is not a part of your core personality that's never going to change. And it's a really important point, uh, a really important aspect of identifying a behavior because we so like so often we say things like well I just do this thing well like or I am that um and we really insert our whole personality into a behavior when we realize that like we don't realize that it is changeable it's constantly evolving and then there's a part of showing kindness to our behaviors and how practiced they are so we hope to change a behavior in a day or a week or whatever. And that could be a behavior that we've been practicing for 20 years. And I would, I would just like to pause on something like that for a second, because if you have a behavior that you're looking to change, I think it's very important to look at how long this behavior has been in place already when you're looking at it and how much practice you have at referring back to that behavior, because you really have a ton of practice at that. And you don't have a ton of practice going, developing a new behavior because you've been, you've been practicing the old one. So there's some kindness to be shown there. And there is a distinct difference between say, acknowledging who you are and acknowledging some of the behaviors that you have and some of the behaviors that you are okay with and some of the behaviors that you are not okay with. Because a lot of times we hide behind, that's just the way that I am. Okay, is that serving you? Are you happy with it? Because if it is serving you, and you feel that you want to, that that is the way that you are, and you're explaining it to someone, and you're like, and I am happy with this, then by all means, keep that in place. But if you're using that's just the way I am as an excuse to not adjust your behaviors, then it's not serving you anymore. Well, you often use the technique or I don't know if this started with mom or like who started saying this, but um, when someone is describing a problem in their life that is a result of a behavior or a perceived problem or a perceived wall that is the result of their own behavior um, and and they revert back to, you know, and it's just, it's just the way I am, you know, I can't, it's, it's, it just doesn't seem like I can be any other way. It just, this is just the way I am. It, I, and I always, you always say to me, how's that working for you? Mm -hmm. Cause, um, the end, right. I mean, how is that working for you? Because if it is working in a way that is leading you towards a, the life that you feel you deserve and the life that is your best version of yourself, then sure, leave that in place. But every behavior always can have the backdrop of how is this working for me? How is this serving me? How is it? Where are we at with this? And I think that's a good place to start when you're looking at if you want to adjust a behavior and if it isn't serving your life. And then I think that the the next step is definitely the fact that you need to realize that every every behavior has a function, okay? It's not mm -hmm. just the way you are because it's the way you are. You woke up one day and that was just embedded, okay? Every single behavior, whether or not you understand it, has a specific function. And we look at this when we're looking at behaviors in children, right? We always, a lot of teachers are now on to the fact that like undesirable behaviors from students, often have like a root cause or a specific function that they're trying to serve. And what we want to do is uncover what the function is. Is this attention seeking? Is this fear-based? Is this because often behaviors come out in such an opposite way of what you would think would be, um, we talk about this with like negative attention a lot with, in children is like, you know, why are children exhibiting behaviors that are getting such extreme negative responses from their teachers, from their parents, from their peers? Um, we can tra track that back often to just any attention is good attention. And that doesn't look like the kind of attention that you want, but the behavior has a function. So 
if your goal is to I change love, I love just pausing on that to talk to look at that for a second because um this is something that I have studied for many years is that behavior because I worked in a behavioral treatment facility <laughs> for children and a lot of times speaking to staff or new staff who would immediately identify something as attention seeking behavior and and categorize it as a negative attention seeking behavior and the fact is is that it is attention seeking but this is meeting a need and we had a lot of kids who would get into restraints intentionally and that is a physical restraint of your body and the fact is is that they were looking for physical contact so badly that they needed to act in a way that someone would physically have to hold them down because they were so destructive, Um, but they were meeting a need. The need was physical contact. You're in a behavioral treatment facility where you can't have a lot of physical contact. You can't touch the other people that are there. You can't really have physical contact with staff. And many of the parents did not show up if, if they were involved at all. So the only visitors would be um, a, a individual therapist or, um, uh, their caseworker. None of those people are hugging them. <laughs> Legally. None of them are hugging them. Yes. Right. And, it, and like that, that is what it is, but like these kids in a certain, and, and of course, a lot of us are looking for physical contact, but some are looking for it more than others and have to have that need met. And you watch them walk around and smash things and do do different things and escalate the danger level to the point of needing to be physically restrained. And it's just like looking for that need. And when you're interacting with other people, when you're interacting with yourself, you have to look, you have to peel back all the other behaviors and look at what is the need that's trying to get to, to be met here and not just look at eliminating the behaviors without addressing the need. It's, it's just like, you know, when we discussed like the habit building and how, you know, taking things away, how your brain wants to add and like taking things away, isn't going to be, um, the strategy that's going to be best designed for, for achieving your goal. And, The same thing with behaviors is like, if there is a need that is being met with an undesirable behavior, we have to find out what it is. First of all, (laughs) we have to address it. And then we have to replace that need so that there's not just a gaping hole. And then you're going to try not to go away. Exactly. (laughs) And then you're going to try not to go back to that behavior. And it's like, that's a recipe for disaster. Um, you know, I looked at some some science stuff because I, I like, you know, the receipts and stuff. And when I was looking at, you know, changing behaviors and like how the brain works, um, there's like two parts of the brain that people often address when they're talking about changing a behavior. It's like the prefrontal cortex, which is like your like reasonable brain, right? It's like cognition. So it's in charge for like rational thought. So we can say, um, okay, when we want to change something, let's take an example of behavior. Um, let's take like an obsessive calorie counter, for example, um, trigger warning ED, if you Very have relatable. any, <laughs> sure, for sure. And I think that there's obviously different levels of this, but if you feel like this would be triggering to you and you, and you're not ready to hear this, um, but obsessive calorie counting is, let's take that as the behavior and we'll say, okay, if a person um, was exhibiting this behavior, there are two parts of their brain we want to address, the rational part of their brain. And that's like what we call the way, like, okay, so we can tell them, hey, um, there are numerous scientific studies to support that obsessive calorie counting is not a mental activity that is healthy. Um, We can tell people that there, there's a whole bunch of science behind calorie counting being incredibly inaccurate up to 25% off every single day. So it's not even accurate numbers that you're using. So the obsession isn't appropriate. We can, we can use all kinds of science to appeal to their rational brain. Right. But you also got to appeal to the other part of your brain that is responsible for behaviors and habits. And that's the reward center. So there's something happening that is 
giving you a hit of dopamine when you exhibit this behavior. And that is like a, a little bit more difficult to address, right? Because this is your motivator. It's like, I do this thing because, and it might be a destructive thing, but it's giving you some kind of reward in that area of your brain. And together, these are kind of making up like your will in your way. Your will is why is the reward that you're getting. And the way is kind of like your rational brain telling you why you're doing this. And if you look at these two systems together, it's really a lot more, um, it's a lot more better when you're addressing these things because you can rationalize someone to death but unless you also look at that motivation factor, are you feeling out of control? Is that why you're obsessively counting calories? Is this a loss of power in another area of your life? Where is that dopamine coming from with this behavior that we can possibly uncover and maybe use a different technique to fill the reward center? Yeah, I I love these questions because they are ones that make you pause and think. So if you heard that and said like, well, why am I looking for control? Am I feeling out of control in other aspects of my life? And I think that those questions are so important to sit and think about because we are in a constant reactionary state. And that is just kind of how our society has developed with quicker moving. And, and we take less time to think about why we are doing something. We're just doing it. We're doing it to get through. We're doing it because we think it's the right way. Someone told us one time calorie counting is it, and I'm like, I don't have time to sift through all the things like, is this serving me? Whatever. And we don't take a lot of time to think about like, well, what need is this serving? What actual need is the serving? And it might take some time to just think about it, let it marinate a little bit. I know I'm a big marinator with anything that I do. I'm like, I'll get back to you in three days. <laughs> um, but it will be a thoughtful response, but it'll take a little bit. Um, because I think some of those, like when it comes to really self-reflecting on a need that we are after, it takes some time. Because we are so multifaceted. We have so many different things going on in our lives where we feel our needs are being met in one place. They're likely lacking in another place. And in the place that we feel we have some control over and food is one of those things that we either feel we need to be really, really in control or really, really out of control. And we are falling on one end of the spectrum and never really riding in the middle. And it takes a long time to get to the middle. And I I, I don't want anyone to judge themselves for not being in the middle because, again, you have a practice behavior with food that has been developed over years and a thought process that has been developed, especially over food for years and calorie counting and all of those type of things. So breaking a behavior like that is really, really difficult. And when you have to practice every day and something that you have to give mindfulness thought to every day is really difficult. But if we can get to where is this need serving me? Like what, what, what is it that I'm looking for? We can kind of figure out different ways where we can still get our need met because your needs not going away. You can still get your need met, but maybe in a more productive way for your life that will also serve you in other aspects of your life. It's a cool concept to, to think of yourself as just one needy bitch <laughs> with all I of mean, these, it's with so all true, these though. needs, it, but it's so true. You have all of these inherent needs and there are so many choices Sometimes they when it conflict. comes. Exactly. And there's so many choices when it comes to filling them. And there's so much involved that, you know, thinking of yourself as, a person who can who can thoughtfully make these decisions is difficult because there's so much history behind your behaviors. And that's the other aspect that I want to hit on for a second. Beyond, you know, the the he, right here and right now, 
your frontal cortex doing the rationing, rational behaviors, and then, you know, your reward system. There is also another layer that is actually one of the ones that is, I think, most responsible for some of the most change resistant kind of behaviors. It's like the, the shit that you've been through. Like yeah. we're talking about like formative trauma, like we're talking about like all of your memories, the part of your brain that senses and triggers emotional responses to threats is so embedded in who you are as a person. And even though some of these things are memories and they've happened in the past and it could be a really long time ago, the way that you're responding today as the person that you are today is reflecting of those experiences. And it's so strange because you're not purposely doing that. And there's nothing happening in your rational brain that is promoting that. But these are just self-protective behaviors. And neither one of those other parts of your brain addressing those is not going to help if you have this like constant reenactment of these traumatic experiences and that and your behavior is rooted in that. So like that's really, I think, one that gets to next next level, next level layer. But if you don't get there with yourself, I don't think changes to behavior is, are going to be lasting. Yeah, it's it's a great point, but it's one of those things where we're all like, or some of us are like, don't want to touch that. <laughs> no, thank you. What do you mean? <laughs> I'm like, no, thank you. I'd rather buy an alarm clock. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't want to touch maybe the reasons why I feel like I can't sleep. Like, I, maybe I feel unsure about decisions. Maybe I feel, um, you know, like any type of way about something that's going on. Don't really want to touch that right now. Like, maybe I'll just get an alarm clock or like, maybe I'll just continue counting calories <laughs> and addressing instead of addressing some of the traumas and the behaviors and how they're linked to some of the traumas. So I think that was our, our first step in, um, how you can start to address some of these behaviors when you figure out, you know, what they are, what the, what the need is being met. And, um, the, the, the next step, I guess, is to identify the story surrounding the behaviors. So, you know, what's going on? Like, what is the thing that you repeat over and over? I know someone that I talk to all the time about calorie counting or being obsessive about macros is she constantly says like, well, uh, I, I feel like it's the only way I can control it. And I'm like, all right, do you want to talk about why you feel the, in the, the deep need to control your food every day? Like, do you want to, do you want to touch it? Or? <laughs> Cause something happened. Something happened to trigger that. And we can we can get one layer deep and recognize that it's a control issue, right? And we can say like, yes, I feel for some reason, for some reason, we use that a lot. For some reason, I use that. I feel a deep need to control my food. Well, yeah. what is but that? I don't want to say the reason or, or address it. <laughs> yep. Right? Because, because a, identifying that is great. And I don't want to downplay the importance of identifying you know, that they're what, what you're, what you're doing with that behavior. But I think that if you truly, truly want to change the behavior, we have to look at the circumstances surrounding these concepts is, did someone at some point, um, introduce concepts surrounding food that could have made could have promoted this behavior? Did somebody at some point make you trust, have trust issues with yourself where you do not feel like you can trust your own instincts? And that is why we're counting every single thing. Um, do you, what, what is the event? I think that's a really big one. Uh, if you guys need to listen to that one back, you might need to just do a little 15 second rewind because I, a lot of us have been conditioned to think you cannot trust what you're feeling. You cannot trust your cravings. And we have an entire society built on the fact that we want women to not trust 
cravings to not trust what they're feeling and a whole bunch of narratives that have been created around that. Like you're too emotional. You can't trust how you think like blah, 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 blah. You can't trust what you um, want to eat today. And it's, and it's been a, a long standing thing and it's really, really difficult to break. It is. And it's, and I don't want, you know, people to hear this and, and think that we're talking about months here. Okay. As, as you said, like when you really uncover the reasons behind this behavior, you will probably date it way back. And if you do the simple math on how long this has been building up and going on, um, it is. It will be clear to you that this will not be a matter of months or even a matter of years. I mean, this is a lifelong thing. That, but I guess, I guess the reward is that with every step, you are freer. And so yeah. it's not like, well, I want this behavior to be changed immediately, or else I'm not happy. It's that if one day you go without calorie counting, and you go, oh, oh my God, I haven't done that in, I haven't done that in 10 years. That's one day that you were freer. And it might not seem like much, even if it's one meal, we can bring it down to the nanosecond. Even if you eat a banana and didn't think about how many calories it had, that is a win. And every single win gets you closer to freedom of your, you know, your trauma, not running your behaviors. And I just, I think that that work is worth it, even if it's never going to be perfect. You know what I mean? Well, here's what I have to say about that, because, you know, I value freedom almost above anything else. And I, that has developed in my life, the more that I've had some small exposures to what freedom feels like, and I've held on to them for dear life. And it's one of those things that like, as you it, it's not like one day it's an aha drop off. I'm finally free of some of the things that I have been um, holding on to for years. But every step, every little one that you take towards that, you also get in return a little bit more of that freedom. So even though this is one of those things that is a lifelong development, you get the feedback as you make the progress, you get these, these feelings of being more confident in yourself, being more confident in your decisions, feeling a little bit more free from, um, being held to some of these obscure, like behaviors that aren't serving you. You get that feedback as you, as you grow and develop. And that's important because we know that there, the reward system part of your brain is imperative in developing new and changing behaviors. So yeah, like getting those little hits to say like, Hey, maybe we didn't get the hit from control, but because we've addressed the reason or the trauma or the event that led to that, it doesn't seem as powerful anymore. And I know that that's a really hard thing because we just want to get an alarm clock and that's easier, right? Because addressing the event or the trauma, it seems like so heavy hitting and it, and it is often, but not addressing it is giving it a ton of power too. Oh yeah. It just sits in the corner collecting power. It's in, in the more it's not addressed, it's almost like the more power it draws to itself because now it's become this giant thing. And I, I find, you know, with people that are addressing trauma through therapy is, you know, one of the major things that they say when they come out is like, I thought I could never talk about this thing, or I thought that it was, it would destroy me to talk about this thing. But actually the more that I talk about this thing, the less power it has over me. And that is the power in uncovering the reasons behind some of these behaviors even though it can be painful, is that it's actually more painful to not address it. And thinking of it in those kind of terms makes it a little, little less scary. And it also sets the groundwork for your your final step, which is final step. We're not, your final step is in the coffin. But I mean, <laughs> when it comes to a certain behavior, you know, you want a new narrative. You know, that's yeah. that replacing the old narrative and the old trauma of I'm not in control if I don't know how many calories I'm counting. I'm not worthy of trusting myself. I, if I don't count calories, I will become a lazy 
person who is not worthy of love and attention or whatever, whatever it is, right? If we can have a new narrative to replace that one, I am worthy of love and attention no matter what I eat, what I look like. I am worthy to trust myself despite anything that might be going on in other areas of my life. These these additions to your narrative and to your story will create alternate behaviors that you can fall back on when it becomes difficult. And having those fallback behaviors is really, you know, think of it just like everything else. It's, it's, it's muscle memory. It's riding a bike. You're going to fall back to what's most comfortable. And so if you can replace the really uncomfortable, undesirable fallback behavior with a new narrative, it's, it's the road. It is. And I think so many times we talk about like, well, address your story and create a new one. And it's like, well, if we haven't looked at what the story has been, what need it's serving, how to address that, and then creating an alternative narrative, an alternative story. Like there's some steps before you can come to what your new story is going to be. And a lot of times I just hear like, we skipped all of those. And it's like, well, well, (laughs) <laughs> we got to look at those first because there was a need there that it need that that had to be met. And in order to in order to move forward from that, we have to address that. So hopefully these steps have been um helpful to you to address some of the behaviors that maybe you would like to change in the next year and they are just that. They are not you. They are not embedded in your personality. They are behaviors that you exhibit that either are serving you or not serving you. And the only person that can tell you which category it goes in is you. Absolutely. And I just want to address the fact that although we are not mental health clinicians or, well, you are, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I do Bro, think over that, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> you of course are, I am not, but these are just opinions and it would, it is really, really important to get with a, a trusted professional. I think that, you know, 100% that this is, this is work that can be done with someone that you trust and that is a professional and, um, that really elevates it to next level. So have a great week. We love you. <laughs>